like the fire. Our scripture today comes from Luke 15, 11 through 32. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth of wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods as the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food, food to spare? Here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard the music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back, safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property, the prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him? My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Pray with me. We thank you, God, again for your word. We pray that by your Holy Spirit you would speak to our hearts, to our very souls, that we might be nourished through it, that we might find comfort, but that we might also be challenged to grow in our journey with you. I pray now, O God, that you would hide me behind the cross of your Son, Jesus, and in everything that is said and done, you would be seen, you would be heard, you would be glorified. I ask it in Jesus' name. We've been doing a walk through the parable of the prodigal son for the last three weeks. We've got... Today and another couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at it as we finish up and as we're doing that walkthrough. We've been looking at what we've been calling aha and how aha unfolds in our lives. If you recall, we said aha is a sudden understanding, a recognition, or a resolution. It's coming to that moment where we kind of wake up, if you will. If you recall, I shared with you that aha has three essential elements. And when they come together, we have our aha moments. The three ingredients that come together to produce that aha are these. The first is a sudden awakening, an awareness of where, what we've done, where we find ourselves. The second is brutal honesty. Being honest with ourselves, with others, and with God. And the third is immediate action. Moving on what we come to understand in the midst of that moment. Now, we've been looking at the younger son in Luke 15. And as you heard read, the young son comes to the father. says, Father, I want my share of the inheritance. The father gives it to him. He packs up all of his things and he takes off for the distant country. He's ready to party, and to party hard. And he does just that. But he comes to the place where he finds that he squandered absolutely everything that he had. And now he's 
dirt poor. He has absolutely nothing to his name. He's out in this distant country, and he finds himself feeding pigs with nothing to eat. And all of a sudden, we're told in that parable that the pig food looks mighty good to him. Because again, he's that hungry. Now last week we began to see the unfolding of his aha moment and how an aha unfolds for us in Luke 15, 17 where Luke records these words. He came to his senses. He had his sudden awakening. His eyes were open. He understands what's going on. And if you recall, I shared with you that Kyle Adelman points out that aha doesn't happen unless all three ingredients are there. It can't just be one. And so we need to keep reading the rest of the story to see how aha unfolds, not only for him, but for us. The sun has a sudden awakening, but it doesn't stop there. As we read on in that passage, it says, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. He had to be honest with himself. And not just honest, but brutally honest. We find that he's come to his senses, but he doesn't stop there. He's honest with assessing his situation. And he is brutally honest, not only with himself, but he's preparing himself to be brutally honest with his father back at home. And even understanding that he sinned not only against his father, but against God as well. What we need to understand is that it's one thing to wake up to the fact that things have gone wrong, that things need to change. That's the easy part. That's the easy part. And actually almost anyone can do that. And a lot of people find themselves at that point in the aha process. The problem that they face, and we do oftentimes as well, is that we never move beyond it. Our eyes are open, we have our sudden awakening, but you now this brutal honesty stuff, I don't know if I want to go there. I'll recognize I've messed up, but I'm not that ready to go any further. It's been said that it's like when you get winded walking up a flight of stairs and you realize that you're out of shape, but you don't want to step on the scale to see how bad it is. <laughs> it's been said it's when you realize you hardly know your wife and kids anymore, but you sweep it under the rug. It's all part of being a good provider. There's nothing that I'm doing wrong. It's been said it's when you get caught, but you lie to get out of trouble. It's been said it's when you're broken alone and you blame everything and everyone but yourself. And that list could go on and on. So many, too many potential aha stories never move beyond the sudden awakening. And the reason is because brutal honesty is not easy. It's difficult. But then again, no one ever said that aha, a true aha moment in our lives, was going to be easy. Now, if we look closely, there are three things in the parable of the prodigal son that are part of what we come to look at today, and that's the second part of that aha process, brutal honesty. One is this, we have to be honest about our circumstances. We have to be honest about our circumstances. In verse 17, we see that the son is honest. First of all, about his circumstances, but he can't stop there. He not only has to realize that he's blown it, but he has to realize that he's in a bad place 
He has to be brutally honest about the fact that he is in the distant country where he took himself, and he's in the midst of the pig pen. And this isn't just something that is momentary. This was a work in progress. He did not set out saying, you know what, I think I'll go to the distant country. I think I'll get me a job in the pig pen. <laughs> Sounds like fun. <laughs> that wasn't it at all. He's already has to be brutally honest with the fact that his choice to leave his father's house has brought him here and that it's not happening by chance. He has to look back and realize exactly what he's done and be brutally honest about why he finds himself where he's at. When we find ourselves in the distant country and we find ourselves in the pig pen, it tends to be much easier for others to see it well before we do. How many times have you watched somebody walking down a path of destruction and say, I can see it a mile away, but they can't see it. And we need to realize that oftentimes people are seeing that in our lives and saying the same thing. Can't they understand where they're heading? Can't they understand what they're doing with their lives? That's part of what makes this part of aha so difficult because oftentimes we can see it in others, but we can't see it in ourselves. What we need to understand is that it's not been one giant step of rebellion that leads us to where we are. It's been a, a slow unfolding process, one step at a time, small steps that take us out to the distant country. We don't even realize that that's where we're heading. You ever gone out for a walk and you weren't really thinking about it while you were walking and all of a sudden it's like, how in the world did I get out here? How did I come this far? It's kind of like that. And oftentimes if we're not careful, we can find ourselves out there in the distant country before we ever realize that we've been there. Now often when you're in the pig pen, when you find yourself there, you might regret the pig pen, but you don't always regret the steps that you took to get you there. What we need to do is we need to come to that place where we're brutally honest about our circumstances that have taken us out there into that distant country. And it means admitting to the fact that yes, we took the steps and recognized the steps that we did take to get us there and then to recognize that we are in that distant country and to recognize that we are in the midst of the pig pen. It's dirty and it's uncomfortable and it's not where we want to be and it's not where we ought to be. It's admitting to ourselves that we are the ones that are responsible for where we are, which brings us to the second, and that is we have to be honest about what brought us to that place. The next piece of brutal honesty we see in the text with, where the son says, I will set out and I will go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and I have sinned against you. There's no blame shifting. There's no trying to pretend it was an accident, no passing off responsibility. There is no hiding, no lying, there's no denying. There is only honesty. And brutal honesty is being able to say, I have messed up. I have sinned. I have fallen short. It's my fault. It's mine. We have to understand that. In his devotional, also entitled Aha, Kyle writes this, and I thought this was interesting. The honesty that is part of Aha is more than a simple acknowledgement. It's a kind of brokenness. When there is recognition but no repentance, Aha doesn't happen. It's one thing, in essence, to say, I've messed 
up. But if there's no repentance, there's no wanting to turn so that we can find our way back out and our, find our way back home to God, it really doesn't mean anything. The question becomes, are we sorry because we got caught? Or are we sorry because we're now in a distant country, in the pig pen? Or because of the circumstances that we're now facing? Or are we genuinely, genuinely sorry and repentant for what we have done? All too often, friends, we find ourselves in the pig pen and we're dealing with the bleakness of our circumstances and the natural thing the kind of the human thing for us to do is to begin to try to shed the blame. It's not my fault. We seek to place the blame on anybody and everybody. Or even on circumstances. Because we just don't want to be brutally honest with ourselves, with others, with God himself. We don't want to be the ones that are in the wrong. We don't want to admit that we've taken the steps that have messed up our lives and taken us out into the distant country, now into the pig pen. <coughs> Sometimes we even want to do that old Flip Wilson thing. For those of you who are old enough to even remember who <laughs> Flip Wilson was. How many of you remember Flip Wilson? All oh, right, all oh, right. And you know what I'm about to say. Remember anything you find? The devil made me do it. Not my fault. The devil, he made me do it. We try our best. We try our best to pass the blame on so that we don't have to deal with it. We don't have to look at it. We don't have to come to terms with it. That's what happens when we find ourselves oftentimes out in that distant country, out in the pig pen. The bottom line is that when we get caught in the pig pen, our natural tendency is to try to find any reason for our circumstances besides ourselves and our actions. Maybe we try to convince ourselves that it's our parents who were too controlling. A husband who was too absent, a wife who was too picky, friends who didn't accept me the way that I was. The list, again, could go on and on and on. But the truth is about what led us to the pig pen is that we have sinned. We have sinned. It needs to be pointed out that we're not talking about being sorry because we got caught. Or sorry because we find ourselves in the circumstances we're now in, out in that distant country, out in the pig pen. We're talking about coming to that point of recognition that we understand that we have fallen short of what God wants for our lives. What God intends for us. And that we have, we have chosen and intentionally walked away from the Father's house. We've walked away from God and that we have sinned. We absolutely need to come to the point where we confess I have sinned and be brutally honest with ourselves. Even as this young son is here now in his circumstances. While this is not easy for us to do, we need to understand that we can't get the kind of aha that we're looking for in our lives if we're not willing to be brutally honest. And the third part of that is we have to be honest about the consequences. We have to be honest about the consequences. There's another element of honesty in the son's statement to himself in verse 19. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. Is what he's going back to say to his father. The son knows that he hasn't just hurt himself. He's hurt his father. He's hurt his brother. He's hurt his entire family. 
Because what we need to understand is that our sin is never private, never personal. It always hurts more people than we will ever know or understand. And while God forgives the guilt of our sin and the eternal punishment we deserve, that doesn't mean there are no consequences for our sin. The son knows that he will face it if he returns home. What he's going to face is a jealous, angry brother. And we see that later on in that passage. He knows that he will face an offended, wounded father. He knows that he's going to face bitter neighbors who know exactly what he did. But when you have a sudden awakening in the distant country, and you find yourself out there in the pig pen, You'd rather face those consequences than the consequences you're currently facing. Brutal honesty is one of the most difficult ingredients of aha. But aha cannot happen unless honesty, brutal honesty, happens. Please hear that. Brutal honesty is one of the most difficult ingredients of aha. But aha cannot happen unless brutal honesty happens. We have to have a sudden awakening. We have to have our eyes open. But then we need to face what we've done and be brutally honest with ourselves, with others, with God. I don't know what you need to be honest about today. But for most of us, it's probably time to look ourselves in the mirror and be honest, brutally honest. Friends, this morning we come to celebrate Holy Communion, and as we do, we're reminded once again that God, through Christ, tells us that we do not have to stay. We do not have to stay in the distant country. He provides for each and every one of us a way back home. All he asks is that we are willing to open our eyes and to see where we are at, what we have done, and to be brutally honest with ourselves, with others, and with God about what we've done. Again, it's not enough to just be awakened to the fact that we're in the distant country, we have to be willing to own it. We have to be willing to own it, to be brutally honest about where we are and what got us there and what's going to happen from here. And again, we need to be careful that we don't start in that brutal honesty path of assessing what got us there and start looking at everybody else and anything else. We need to look in the mirror first. As we come to the Lord's table this morning, it becomes for us, I believe, an opportunity to experience an awakening. An awakening. But it also provides for us an opportunity to be brutally honest about where we have been and where we are. And it also becomes an opportunity for us I believe, to begin the journey back home. Just like the father in the story who was waiting for the young son to welcome him back home. God, our Heavenly Father, is also waiting with open arms, ready to welcome you, me, anyone who will come. So again, this morning, we celebrate God's grace that redeems us and welcomes us back. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, we give you thanks and praise for your grace that truly redeems us, for your grace that gives to us hope for today and hope for all eternity. We confess, O oh God, that too often we have found ourselves in the distant country. 
and we refuse to have our eyes open. We refuse to be brutally honest about what got us there and how we have been responsible. Forgive us, we pray, O oh God, and help us, we pray, to find that forgiveness anew this morning as we celebrate this sacrament of Holy Communion. May this truly be a grace-filled moment, O oh God, where we sense your presence, where we sense your arms wide open, ready to embrace us, inviting us to journey back home. Well, God bless these elements and we who come to partake of them. Let this truly be a grace-filled moment for each of us. For we ask it in Jesus' name.